Welcome everyone, I'm Margaret Wakefield Worcester, President of the Vermilion Historical Society. Tonight's program is being videotaped, so please silence your cell phones, please. Glenn Futcher is a member of, of the Board of Directors of the Vermilion History Museum and a member and volunteer for our Vermilion Historical Society. He has compiled his family's collection of photos and vintage movies into a video presentation. The Historical Society's 2024 calendar is over on the table there. Um, featuring Crystal Beach Park are available for sale after the program. They are five dollars each. They are also for sale at the Vermilion History Museum and in Bromer's Chocolate. Please welcome Glenn Coach. Thank you. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, a lot of my family was involved in commercial fishing over the generations and my dad even tried his hand at it for a little while when he first got out of high school. Um, so most of what I presented here is material that my dad had accumulated over the years and uh, the stories that he had told me about fishing in general and, and commercial fishing and his family involvement in it. And I think we'll get started. When my father, Bill Kutcher, was out of high school, he got a job in the commercial fishing industry. Following many family members, including his father, grandfather, and numerous uncles. For two years, Bill and his brother Kenny operated a fishing boat on their own, but my dad told me they just couldn't make a go of it. My father then left commercial fishing to become a mechanic. His career as a mechanic led him to own two businesses in the Vermilion area and become an instructor for auto mechanics at the Joint Vocational School in Oberlin. Over the years, my father accumulated much information and photos about commercial fishing. I am using this material combined with the stories my dad has told me to put together this presentation. I would like to credit Gary Hosko, who filmed most of the home movies, documenting how the work was done. Gary originally shot the movie with a 16 millimeter camera, which was converted to VHS and eventually made into a digital format. So please excuse the quality. I will start with a short history of fishing on Lake Erie. Long before Europeans came on the scene, the Native American people have lived along Lake Erie and its tributaries. Waterways were the roads of the time, so for the most part, that's where the settlements were. The waters also supplied nutrition for the Native American. Fish were a fundamental source of food. Native Americans would catch the fish in streams and shallow Lake Erie waters. The fish were so plentiful, only simple techniques were needed. Using local materials like basswood, willow, and metal, simple nets could be fashioned. Spear fishing was also used sometimes at night with a light from a torch to draw the fish close. The Native Americans would smoke the fish to preserve it for later use. Historical records would show that European settlers were seen fishing around 1815 in the Maumee River. Twine nets had replaced the nets made from natural brush. By 1830, fishing was an important part of the local economy. Around 1850, pound nets and gill netting operations were being introduced to Lake Erie. By 
1870, there were over 100 pound nets in use in the lake. <coughs> pound nets were made by setting wooden poles into the lake bed and hanging netting between them. Long lead nets would direct the fish into the heart of the net and then into the crib. This is Edward Grodi. He is my dad's great-grandfather. The 1900 census listed his occupation as a fisherman. The following photos probably show the conditions that Edward worked in as a fisherman. Here we can see fishermen working the pound nets in shallow Lake Erie water. When the boats got back to the fish house, the day's catch would be unloaded. And then taken inside to be processed. These three fishermen are showing off a large sturgeon they caught off Kelly's Island in 1935 that weighed 180 pounds. Here, down the course, shows off a sturgeon that was caught somewhere around 1980 while he was fishing for Tishman Fish Company. Around 1900, steam power made gill netting a much more profitable venture. By 1935, pound nets had been replaced by trap nets, which gave the fishermen more options as where to set them. The gear used after 1935 changed very little going forward into the 1980s. One of the two systems commercial fishermen were using in the 1950s was trap netting. This diagram shows a trap net as you can see, it is made up of multiple size and shaped net panels anchored to the lake bed. The trap net was set so the lead was at right angles to the expected travel of the fish. The lead net could be a thousand feet long. When the fish would encounter the lead net, they couldn't get through so they would turn and swim alongside of it until the trap itself. Once they were in the crib of the net, they couldn't escape. The trap net would be loaded onto the fish hook. It had to be loaded in such a manner that the first part of the net that went into the water was the last part loaded onto the boat. At Kishman Fish House in Vermilion, there was a ramp that could be lowered so that the net truck could back out onto it and load the net directly onto the boat. As the fish migrated in the lake with the seasons, it took a lot of experience to know exactly where to set the net. My father once told me that his uncle Don LaForce was very good at picking where to set the net. My dad said Don would reach down and cup some water in his hand and smell it. If Don wasn't satisfied, they would continue on. When Don decided it was a good place, they would deploy the net. The first part of the net to be deployed was the lead. As the main part of the net was set out, it must have been like a geometric puzzle being put together under the water. Setting the net was labor intensive and required experience, knowledge, and seamanship. The crews in the middle of the lake and on their own, no way to call the fish house and ask a question. The fishermen also had a battle, the Lake Erie weather. Here we can see the fishermen deploying the crib for the main part of the net. When all parts of the net were in the water, the anchors 
fishers used to, to hold the net in place. The fishermen would use a little boat called a kringle to help set the net and anchors. These photos show the H.B. Kishman setting a trap net following the same process. When it was time to check the net to see what you had caught, the fishermen would snag a buoy and then winch up the crib of the net to the side of the boat. On the top of the crib was what was called a zipper. They would open this to unload the fish. The fish would be scooped out with net. As the fish were removed from the net, the sorting process would begin. Undesired species and undersized fish would be thrown back into the lake. Once the fish were sorted, they would be placed into boxes and ice would be spread over the catch. If the fishermen had a really good catch and ran out of boxes, the fish would be stored on the open deck until they got back to the fish pond. While sorting the fish during the spawning season, the fishermen would harvest the eggs and the milk from the fish. They would put this mixture in buckets and stir it up. They would then pour this mixture back into the lake in an effort to sustain the fish population. The fishermen would also collect the egg milk mixture into a container provided by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. The officers would pick up the container and take it to the fish hatchery they operated at Putin Bay. The fertilized eggs would then be put into hatching jars. These jars had lake water pumped through them as the eggs would hatch. The hatchery is no longer in operation and is now an aquatic visitor center operated by the Ohio State University Ohio Sea Grant in conjunction with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. The visitor center features educational exhibits hands-on activities, and its own fishing pier. The conditions in the jar 
would stimulate the natural environment where the fish would breed. The newly hatched fish would be collected in troughs and then distributed back into Lake Erie. During the late morning and the early afternoon, the fish house stocks would be quiet, but then the boats with the day's catch would start coming in and the docks would become a beehive of activity as the day's catch was unloaded. These two photos show the fishermen unloading at the Kishman Fish House in Vermilion. After the fish were unloaded, they would be cleaned and ready for market. In this photo, we see Ray Full overseeing the operation at Kishman Fish House. The fish would be sent through a descaling machine and moved over to the cleaning station. Skilled hands would cut the fillets to be sold. When a trap net was recovered from the lake, the first step was to pull the numerous anchors that held the net in place. Then the net was pulled out of the water and piled on the fishing tub. When back on shore, the net was clean as it was unloaded. The second major way commercial fishermen were using to catch fish in the 1950s was gill netting. The nets would be set at right angles to the anticipated route the fish would be traveling. The size of the mesh holes would target the desired size fish. In this updated photo of the Vermilion River, we can see in the foreground the drying reels that were used to dry the gill net. Gill net boats were designed to be completely covered, protecting the crew from harsh weather conditions. The net was pulled into the fishing tug by a motorized pulley. The fish would be removed from the net inside the cabin. 
then the Gelnet could be redeployed. Oh, and that trouble runs no deeper than schools of yellow perch, a prize catch for commercial fishermen. New state regulations have hamstrung gillnet fishermen like these men in Vermilion, Ohio. They're beached until October in this Lake Erie port because their season was reduced from 10 months to five. And the state has set a new legal minimum size on yellow perch. Until March, they can land eight inch fish. Today, the limit is eight and a half inches. And to comply with that law, gillnetters have had to spend thousands of dollars to purchase new and larger mesh nets. While trap netters like Don McCor Sr. can continue fishing through the summer, they too must comply with a new minimum size. Tom Lawson of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources says there was good reason for the new regulations. Data showed us the population in the Central Basin for yellow perch were in a very stressful situation. In order to have the population rebuild, we have to have reproducing females. The regulation of the 8 inches did now allow a sufficient number of 8 inch of reproducing females to survive to escape the gear. For CBS News on Lake Erie, I'm Jim Douglas. By 1985, all gill net fishing was banned in Ohio Lake Erie water. A third, less used method of commercial fishing was seam netting. This operation was conducted from the shore of Sandusky Bay or the shallow shore of western Lake Erie. The seam net would have a haul line attached to each end. A motorized boat would tow a barge with the net on it out into the water. The first haul line was attached to the shore. Then the seam net would be fed out parallel to the shore. The second haul line would be brought back to the shore. Both haul lines would be attached to a motorized winch and the net would slowly be pulled to the shore. Once the net was near the shore, the fish would be unloaded from the net and sorted. Currently, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which was formed in the 1960s, facilitates the management of Great Lakes fisheries between the United States and Canada. The Lake Erie Committee of that commission oversees the Lake Erie fishery. The Ohio Department of Natural Resources manages the Ohio waters of Lake Erie. Of Ohio's total allowable catch, 65% is reserved for recreational fishing. At most, 35% of Ohio's total annual catch is allocated to commercial fishing. As of March 2021, Ohio's commercial fishery consists of 18 trap nets, 11 seam nets, and four trot line licenses. Trap net fishing is permitted in Ohio waters, except in the zones shown in this map. Commercial perch fishing is permitted for trap netting only. No commercial walleye fishing is permitted in the U.S. waters of Lake Erie. Starting in 2008, GPS vessel monitoring and electronic catch reporting have been required. There is quite a number of fish sport fishermen might catch on Lake Erie. Three of the most common are smallmouth bass, which usually run between two to four pounds. Yellow perch, which usually are four to 10 inches long and travel in schools. And walleye, also known as pickerel, usually are four to eight pounds. Lake Erie is known for its great walleye fishing. There were a lot more jobs to be done around the fish house. Here, Ray Cole directs the cleaning of a fish boat. The boats also needed constant attention. We see Jake Kutcher taking a break while doing boat maintenance. Inside the Twine House, nets were made any time of the year. Bill, of course, is standing at a 
the transnet we made the fishermen. Lacourche used these plans to make the net. He could scale these plans up or down to make the desired size net. Up at the top is a note that says 16 foot fishermen. After the net was finished, it had to be tarred. It was actually a heavy oil kind of preservative. The oil preservative was heated and the nets were submerged into the warm oil. After the nets were coated, they could be laid out to dry in a field. When the nets were dry, then they would be loaded on the truck. This is an aerial view of the nets drying in a field along the lake shore just east of the Erie Lorraine County line. The old Crystal Beach Park is in the foreground. In this picture, Enos LaCourse, Al Foster, and Bill LaCourse are mending nets in the field just pictured. Bill LaCourse was what was called a twine man, one who was proficient at maintaining and making nets. These are some of Bill's twine shuttles used in working on the nets. The fishermen would carve their own shuttles. My cousin, Tom LaCourse, told me when he was old enough, he would go with Grandpa when he was mending nets. His job was to refill the shuttles with twine so Grandpa could just keep working on the nets. This is a picture of a twine shuttle being used to mend the nets. As with my father's family, commercial fishing was often a family affair. Here we can see Bryce and Tom meeting, helping out on their father's Trap net boats had their engines in the front compartment. The easiest way to run the exhaust was straight up and out top. This boat, the Peerless, operated during Prohibition, and its exhaust was run out the back of the boat. My dad said that this was because they had an adapter that they could put on the exhaust, so the exhaust would come out underneath the water muffling the noise. This would be a distinct advantage if you were trying to cross the lake at night without being noticed. There were also those once in a lifetime jobs like refloating the broken down gill net tug Mary F in the Vermilion River. Once it was refloated, the tug was towed out into the lake to be sunk. Apparently, once it was out in the lake, it wouldn't sink, and explosives had to be used to finally sink. No matter the weather, the equipment had to be maintained. The fishermen are spreading the nets in a field, even though there is snow on the ground. This fish tug and the net on its deck had become encrusted in ice after operating in sub-freezing temperatures out on the lake. The net still had to be unloaded. When winter was approaching, the boats would be pulled and stored on shore. This is a picture of Alva Snow, boat JCS. Shown here are the Parsons boats laid up for the winter, rich in front, down behind it. Another job that could only be done in the winter was cutting ice from the river for the ice house. The ice would be used the next summer to preserve the catch until it got to the fish house. Howard Kutcher is shown holding the blade used to cut the ice. Once the ice was cut into blocks, they would be moved with poles to the shore to be put in the ice house. 
A business supporting the fishing industry was the construction of the fish slip. These two tugs are being built next to the old State Street Schoolhouse in Vermillion. It wasn't all work. There was also time to relax and have lunch out on the lake or a little horse play with the other fishermen. And who could resist the urge to see whose tug was the fastest? On days off, you could take the family and friends out on the lake. The caption on this picture was, Fisherman's Christmas Party at Vermilion Fireman's Hall. December 1942. The commercial fishing industry had provided jobs to people along Lake Erie's coast for many decades, including my dad and many relatives. Kitchen Fish Company was the biggest fishing operation in Vermilion, located along the Vermilion River near downtown Vermilion. The Kishman Company was a large complex of farms that by the early 1980s was falling into disrepair and eventually closed. These images show Kishman's just before the complex was demolished. The commercial fishing industry had been in decline for decades. Man-made changes to the fish habitat like the building of dams and draining of marshes had compromised fish spawning sites. The man-made pollution is well documented and had in general degraded the health of Lake Erie. Finally, the regulations by the state of Ohio had begun to favor sport fishing activities over commercial fishing. Now shadows of the past commercial fishing operations are fading, or in this case, rusting away. Thank you. Um, over here we have some stuff that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. The pictures of the old Kishman fish house. Margaret was kind enough to bring in an old piece of siding from the old fish house. And um, there's twine shuttles here and weights that were used to uh, keep the nets aligned. My grandfather, my great grandfather used this twine shuttle and he probably carved it himself. But the, there's also options later on where you could get store-bought shuttles and use those. So what, you, is, what is that? This, Larry Hall brought this in. He said it's a float from Kishman's that uh, he picked up there just before they closed. And it was used to support the buoys to identify the nets uh, in the lake. So um, they knew whose nets they were, and the boaters uh, wouldn't drive through the nets. They wouldn't know to go around. So I'll be glad to entertain any questions you might have. Yes, please. How often did they empty those nets? Was that a daily thing or a weekly thing or 
I gotta be honest with you, I really don't know, but I think it was pretty regular because they, uh, they would want the fish to be fresh, obviously. Um, I never worked in the fishing industry personally. Um, my dad did for a short time and many other family members, but uh, I was never out there doing that. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How many other commercial fisheries were there in this area? Were there oh, there was quite a few. Um, I know that Snell and Tishman and Parson and I'm sure uh, there's quite a few other ones that were active in Vermillion. The Lake Erie is divided up into three basins, and Vermillion is right near where the Western Basin and the Central Basin meet. And um, the Western Basin is a lot shallower, so you would get different fish there. And the Central Basin is a little bit deeper, and if you go all the way to the <coughs> east, Basin, it's a lot deeper. So um, that would influence the kind of fish you would get. A lot of the fish companies would have boats that would operate out of Toledo for a while, and then they would move to Vermilion, and then eventually they moved to Fairport, you know, as the fish migrated in the lake. Haskell fishery also. Hosko? Uh, yeah, I think it's H A S K O. Oh, okay. Well, there's Hosko also. They operated out of Vermillion also. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'd say. Yeah. 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 Um, and they were based in Toledo. Yeah. But they would, you know, move their boats as they needed to. Fishman had boats out of here, too. Yeah. I think they fished out of Fairport also. Did they? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did they say it's 35% now that is only commercial fish? Yes. So uh, how do they attribute the decline? Because before they had to save the eggs and then replenish them, do they still have to do that? I'm not sure. Uh, the, the hatchery that was no in the movie is no more. Right. Um, so what are they doing to replenish it? Or do you know well, the they're, they're controlling how much is caught. How much is, yeah. Uh, they've really dialed back on the American side, the commercial uh, activities. The Canadian side, and this, this is a sore point for some of the commercial fishermen, mm -hmm. uh, the Canadian side, they're allowed to fish much more liberally than they do on the American okay. side. Most of our perch comes from the Canadian side now. Yeah. What is the perch limit now on just regular fishing? I'm not really sure. I, um, like I know they, it, in fact, I think it's, it's different ten. in the no, central it's basin. Ten it's 10 in the central. There's, 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 there's a there's like ten, 10 fish now. Oh, yeah. there's, there's there's a three. Three. I've only been doing really fishing game. And we had the wildlife officer there uh -huh. if you last go, night. If you go west of the Cranberry Bay, Creek is a you get 30. In the western basin, east you're allowed of Bray, more perch. You get thirty. And yes. you're allowed to walleye than you're allowed in the eastern. Oh. And they're real strict. You can't go out of Vermillion and go into the western basin and catch the women allowed in the western basin, bring them back into Vermillion. Oh, I didn't know that. You got you to gotta bring what you where we are in the Eastern Basin, yeah. Okay. She explained that very carefully to us. Yeah, I know they're they're strict on that. Yes, sir. I just have an observation or two. Uh, the pound nets. It's in it's in, it's in regards only to pound nets, but you put the stakes all the way to the bottom. Yeah. And when they first developed this in Lake Erie, because the western end is so shallow, there was talk of putting a run all the way across the lake oh, to the Canadian shore, which it's nice that that never came off. <laughs> yeah. One of the things, in 1885, you could have more than one heart or pot off each line going. In other words, they would angle like that, and at the end of each angle, you would have a heart and then a pot that you would pull a fish on. And in 1885, 
between Vermillion and Cedar Point, there were 190 of those pots that Chris set off the shore. So you were really taking a lot of pictures. Yeah. That's good information. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, sir. Who manages the nets between here and Sandusky now when you're heading that way? I'm not sure. I gotta be honest with you. I really don't know. And then the, the follow up aren't there still a couple of fishing boats coming out of Vermillion? I, I'm not aware of any, but uh, there could be, I guess. <laughs> there was one that I know, and that was a couple of years ago. Um, Yes. How do they tell whose nets belong to which fish company? Um, the buoys would be painted differently. Yeah. That one, that one had some kitchen stripes. Down. Yeah. Um, they, so when the fishermen went by the the net, they would know from the colors on the buoy whose net it was. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.